Alex, uh, can you begin to tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Um, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> my background is varied. I've, I've done, like many other people, done a lot of different things. Um, uh, I've had accounting practices. I've owned uh, commercial industrial businesses. Uh, um, currently, what I'm trying to do is uh, finish three books and um, lecturing uh, across uh, Southern California and the Western states, trying to get out information that I agreed to put out uh, regarding the Earth dilemma, uh, the situation that we all face here. Um, unfortunately, uh, and I apologize, I'm two years behind schedule. I was supposed to start lecturing uh, two years prior to this. I've really been out since October of 93. It'd be almost a year. And um, uh, that's currently what I'm trying to do. So a lot of my energy and focus has been going towards that. Now, you're in contact with the Andromedans. Who exactly are the Andromedans? Um, they're a particular race uh, that exists in the constellation of Andromeda. Um, they're just one of thousands that exist out there. Um, they are the particular races that I talk to uh, and have had contact with and have uh, given me and shared information with me are human. Um, they're white skinned to light blue skinned, anywhere from four foot tall to eight feet tall. And they are human in, 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 every, in every way. Now, where, um, did, where did they originate, Alex? All human life originated in Lyra. Um, and when Lyra fell uh, during a war, uh, long before it's uh, it, it, this one of the stars there exploded, um, they migrated out uh, from Lyra during a war uh, in, in order to preserve the race, and they went to different parts of our galaxy. Um, so all human life originated from Lyra originally. Um, because of their environment, they will, uh, from generation to generation, pick up physical changes uh, depending upon the surface and the uh, organics of their planets or, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the different colored race skins uh, have to do with, with genetics involving the stars in which that they're exposed to. Um, so that's basically where they came from. So their primary home star then is Lyra? Yes. And is that currently Originally still their, their home star? No, there's no uh, human life in Lyra. So now where do they exist now? In the constellation of Andromeda. Okay. Throughout the constellation? Yes. Okay. They, they must be very plentiful then. There must be a, a great vast civilization there. If yes, they there exist. is. It's an ancient, ancient race. It, have they described what their civilization is like to you? Yes, they have. Yeah. Could you go into <laughs> sure. some of the details that, that strike you the most about their civilization? Um, they're uh, essentially, a, a, no matter where they are, they're a, a one-world government. Uh, and, uh, their society is would be approximately 4,700 years more advanced than ours on a spiritual level. On a technological level, they're, they're 50,000 years. Now, but there's a balance between... Uh, their technology. In other words, the technology they create is based on, on a spiritual necessity to evolve and not on one to defend themselves, even though it can be used for that. Now, when you say 4,700 years advanced spiritually, yes. how, do, how do you measure spiritual advancement in years? I don't, I don't really know. That's, that's how, what they've, they've expressed to me. I see. Um, and they don't even use time uh, in, in their world. Uh, there's no such thing really. Um, but they use those numbers to accommodate us so that we can use those as a point of reference. I see. Okay. Um, what do they, uh, do they call their world in, in their language? Uh, they, don't, they don't speak. Everything is a symbol there. Uh, the whole race is telepathic. Um, and, and I want to uh, back up just a little bit. There are 28 different races there. Not all are human. Um, many are, are dimensional, plasmic, organic, uh, that were there before the human aspect of the Andromedans themselves or the Lyrans got there and became Andromedans. 
um, there's a lot of life on the different dimensional levels that if we were to go to fifth density um, we would be physical on fifth density even though here we're on third density our perspective of them is being spirit so uh, you know on each of the different dimensions there is an abundance of life that is completely different than how we would perceive it um, because you know our, our perception is of what third density is like even fourth density is very different but we will have physical form in fourth density now is third density the lowest density or are there other lower uh, the animal and insect kingdoms would be in, in planetary systems uh, would be considered lower but to be perfectly honest with you I've not had a clear definition of that because I haven't asked um, my focus really has been us and where do we go from here right. so now the what is the main difference between the third density and the fourth density um, the real difference is consciousness um, in fourth density you can pretty much instantly create uh, what it is that you think whatever your thoughts are you manifest almost instant well it'll be almost instantaneously uh, so there is a, a major degree of responsibility in dealing with that also in fourth density we become more of a group mind um, in fourth density we're all telepathic in other words everybody can read each other's minds which means you have to be real you can't have hidden agendas because people will see right through you also in fourth density uh, we all become clairvoyants we'll be able to see energy fields see life forms um, which means that if you're hiding something it'll be seen instantaneously um, they've also said that in fourth density when we move into that um, our court systems will change they're still uh, a positive and negative but that exists all the way to the fifth density where you will experience to a, a strong degree the, uh, the dualities in, in, in our everyday environments um, what will happen is you'll have a judge and you'll have uh, a jury who will all be clairvoyants and they will read the energy field and know who's telling the truth and who isn't um, and, and everything will be judged based on that will be based on energy um, not on words uh, uh, when you in fourth density when you walk by somebody or you touch somebody's hand you will instantly know everything about them um, so again there will be no hidden agendas everybody will really have to be real and if they choose to have and continue to play out their agendas um, whatever those are then they will have the space but you will know uh, or people will know um, I will know who we're dealing with instantaneously um, what is there an economy and what is the basis no. of their economy? Is it like a spiritual economy or is it uh, like the value? I've heard some people describe their views of, of other extraterrestrial civilizations as having a spiritual economy where the amount of psychic energy you put into something is given a value. Have they de expressed any, uh, how their, their social systems work? Okay, I, I know a little bit about that essentially everybody is given exactly what it is they need to evolve um, there are many different races each race has their own uniqueness about them based on their particular belief systems and my understanding is that everything is a belief system as far as the Andromedan culture uh, children go to school uh, or the Andromedans they go through a birth process just like we do those that are physical they go to school for anywhere from 120 to 150 years they're taught all of the major sciences and arts uh, there would be equivalent to PhDs or doctorates or masters whatever you want to call it in all of the arts it is at that point once they're done with all of that education that they choose what it is that they wish to do or to evolve and they can change their mind anytime they want the whole purpose is the evolution of the soul um, and life they're given whatever it is that they need to do that um, I'm not aware of crime or um, uh, whatever uh, uh, or, or um, anything along those lines their whole focus is on education and not distraction 
um, if it's something that is not educational, from what I've observed, it's just simply something they're not interested in. Um, they just have it within them to constantly evolve on, a, on an educational as well as a spiritual level. And whatever they need is there for them to use. I'm not aware of um, uh, them having to pay anything for it. No. Um, it's uh, it just, to my knowledge, it doesn't exist. Now, is art and music important to them, too? Yes, all of it is. Um, but those things are very different than what we perceive. Um, art is, is, the, is creation to them. Things that are created out of thought, um, out, of, out of the isness, what they call isness, the Pleiadians call creation what we call God. Things that are created just by thought, by, uh, by nature, that they consider art. They use extensively holographic uh, technology. Um, music, their music is, is of, the, of the universe, of what the music that certain planets make as they rotate around their sun. Uh, what different solar systems make as they revolve around their sun, and what whole systems, uh, the sounds and, and energy that they create, to them that's their music. And then they put things together, different uh, constellations, different star systems, they'll put those together and overlap them to create music. Um, it's different than what we just pull out of thin air here. How have they expressed uh, what their daily life is like? Uh is there, a, is there a solar day for them, or is there a night or day, or what is their daily life like, or per periods of life? Um, there is really, to my knowledge, no set schedule. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of what I observed on one of their motherships. Um, they don't require much sleep, um, to, my, to my knowledge, um, simply because I guess uh, they're very healed. They're, they're beings, their physical form, um, they're just incredibly healed. Um, they're just in touch. Um, there is no night and day. Uh, they, they don't need to experience that. Although I'm, I'm sure other races have that, but the Andromedans don't. Um, they're just constantly stretching themselves, um, uh, trying to evolve and experience more and more and more all the time. Um, they're happy people. Um, they don't have the extremes of emotions that we express here. In fact, I've been told that virtually few races in the entire galaxy express the realm of, of emotions that we, we experience here. Um, they're just always in, in, a, in a very wonderful space. Um, there's, they're, they're not a civilization that really judges. Um, they do accept things the way they are. Um, with the exception of when those things threaten their particular lifestyle or what they're about, their essence, um, and others, what uh, other uh, races might experience or, or perceive as a threat. Now, um, Alex, you said they're evolving uh, spiritually. What do they want to evolve towards? What spiritual goals do they have? I guess to be just the best that they are, to be completely at one with all that there is um, at all times. Um, you know, there are 11 creational densities, and my understanding is that within each of the densities, you change your physical form. Their goal as a race is to go from, from, from the densities that they experience, which are three, three, four, and five, I guess to move to five, six, seven, and eight, and then from there, 8, 9, and 10, and then to 11, and now the new dimensional realm that's being created, 12. It's just to continue to evolve. Um, nobody knows exactly what the ultimate goal is, um, because the, uh, the essences that they're in, control, in touch with that are on 9th, 10th, and 11th are continuing to evolve. And now there's a 12th density that's being added to our universe, and they're being drawn up to experience this new density. So nobody really knows what the ultimate spiritual goal is. Um, they themselves are still searching for what God is. They know it exists, um, but what it is, nobody really knows, which is why they call it the isness. It's, it's just a force that's there. And, that, and how we perceive it is based on how we perceive ourselves and our own belief structures, belief systems. And that's how we use the energy to create. 
Now, you mentioned that they're in contact with essences from the 9th, 10th, and 11th. Yes. Can you describe what they describe these beings to be like t to them and what they would be like to human beings? It's just pure consciousness. What their daily lives are like, I don't know. I don't have any idea. Have they described them at all in, in, in any sort of detail? To you? Just light. Just light. Just light. Just light. Just light. <laughs> you know, that, that's all I know. Okay, now, uh, what abilities do the Andromedans possess that exceed those of Earth humans? You mentioned telepathy. Well, uh, you mentioned see, that, that's an interesting question, and, and I don't know that I necessarily like the way you put it. The, la the, the abilities that they have are latent in everybody. They just haven't lived in a society that has been s screwed with like we have been here. They're all telepathic, they're all clairvoyant, they're all healers because they're taught all of the sciences. Um, they're just, they're, they're whole. Uh, I, I guess that's, that's the only way that I can put it f to you is that they're completely whole. Every soul knows, knows who they are, they know who they've been, they know what their reincarnational past has been. They as a soul have an, a personal agenda which every time they incarnate they're consciously aware of. So, so they know where they're going. They see improvement in themselves life after life after life. We, if we hadn't been so screwed with here, would have the same abilities. We could very much be where they are. Um, but we've been manipulated incredibly for the last 5,700 years. Um, on an intense level every day. Uh, our real manipulation really started about 14,000 years ago when um, the Orion group started uh, uh, manipulating our DNA structure. So um, it isn't that they're better because they're not. We're just different. We're a little bit behind than they are because of our, our manipulations here. Um, but the, the, the real bottom line here is we're all spirit. Um, we, we contain a soul. That soul is a part of all that is. And that soul has been really trying to be recognized in each of us. And it hasn't been because of the material and the belief systems that we have evolving around us being earth people, about being physical and about the real truths of our essence, of our existence, of who we are, having been blinded from us, from our spiritual teachings, uh, from the religions, and, uh, and us being convinced that we're something that we're not, that we're physical, that we're animal form, and we're not. We're spirit. Our spirit animates these physical forms, period. Alex, what is the Andromedan Council? It is a, excuse me, it is a, a political body um, that's represented by now 133 different uh, races and cultures and planetary systems. There are over 1,200 systems and planetary races, evolving races that are, that could be part of the Andromeda Council, but not all of them are. Um, uh, it is, it would be comparable to Earth here too like a United Nations, except it's not a United Nations in the sense that um, it has a political agenda. Um, the Andromedan Council, as, as, as a body, um, their, so their sole purpose is to facilitate evolvement of all life in the galaxy. And that's really what their goal is, is to allow all um, life forms to evolve on their own. Um, uh, without manipulation. Uh, obviously that's not occurring here on Earth. And we're not the only ones. This is occurring on 22 other planets in our galaxy. Um, but the other planets are not um, stuck in the muck that we are to the degree that we are here. And this is a, a major concern for them because we're not, we're not moving in a direction uh, that we should be moving. There are elements here that are definitely holding us back. Um, and because Earth has become this, this, this real prize, and not only Earth, but us um, as well. So I'm, I'm getting off a little bit. Um, 
I want to stay with their questions. So its overall goals then are to elevate the spirituality of all life forms in their own particular ways. Evolutionary uh, ways, right. That okay. they evolve according to the degree of their consciousness. Now how and why was it first brought into existence? The I don't know. Yeah. When um, I do know that it was formed it was formed shortly after the Orion Wars, which was a huge war that lasted 600,000 years in our galaxy. And it was predominantly between the humans, the human race, of which there's all kinds of humans, hundreds of billions of humans, and those of reptilian races that do coexist in our galaxy. Now, when there was no winner, by the way. Apparently, both sides got so tired of killing each other, they just kind of just stopped, and and a undeclared truce was formed. And uh, I know in, in Orion, where there's a very large group, they have their own political group called the Orion Group, and the humans and other life forms that came together uh, formed the Andromedan Council. And there are others, you know, that are that are a small part of each of the, of the galaxy and, and other galaxies apparently have their own little groups where people come together and decide um, you know what's happening or they communicate with each other there's trade there's bartering there's a sharing of, of, of wisdom of knowledge of essences so that everything can evolve together and uh, uh, you know work work in, 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 a, in an unconditional love type of, of space you're lucky you're a lucky person, I think. I, I know you have a very difficult task, but I think you're very lucky to be given this wisdom. Um, I think you're very lucky. Uh, when did their interaction with human beings on Earth begin? 1980. 1980? 1980. And how did that begin, and what was the essence of that interaction? Okay. Um, it really all evolved around the Palladians themselves. Uh, Earth has been the subject of discussion for a long time. What really, the real attention and focus really started um, uh, when we started uh, detonating our first nuclear weapons. We did, as a race. Uh, nuclear weapons had been used here in our ancient past hundreds of thousands of years ago because uh, there have been wars here between a lot of different factions, predominantly most of them human. Um, the Pleiadians had agreed or offered to come back here and try to help raise the consciousness of the planet. Well, apparently what happened was when they got here, uh, they were really faced with their past. Uh, the Pleiadians had had incredible civil wars amongst themselves and others, other wars. Um, and they had just moved into a fourth and fifth density consciousness and they didn't want to come back here and take the warrior space again. And because of the Greys' in involvement, or involvement here, and the Orions, and a small group from Sirius B, and the Orion group, and a group from, Rig from Rigel that are here as well, <coughs> and others, they didn't want to come back here and have to move into warrior space. So they started dragging their feet. In other words, they didn't do as much as they needed to do. Well, as this is occurring, you know, changes in our, in our galaxy are also occurring, and they're moving at a much faster rate. So the Andromedans finally said, well, what is happening? What have you accomplished? And the Pleiadians basically said, you know, we're having our own conflicts dealing with this because the Pleiadians themselves have a tremendous amount of karma with, with our solar system, you know, with Mars and, and, and Earth. They simply just weren't as motivated as they should be or could have been to start making the changes here. They also had made some communications with the Earth governments that didn't go very well at all. So basically, they said, well, we don't know what to do. So the Andromedans themselves said, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. We'll, we'll take this because it is important for the whole. We'll make an effort. Now, the Andromedans were probably the better choice because they don't have any karmic ties to us. So they're, they're completely um, neutral and they're probably better observers as well because of their neutrality. So they've basically been taking over and what they did was they got involved in 1980. Uh, they're working with the Pleiadians, with the Syrians. Um, uh, they have... Uh, Which group of Syrians? Uh, from Sirius A. Sirius A. 
Um, so what they're doing here now is they're trying to raise the consciousness. They came back in time to 1964 to contact me. I'm not the only one. There are others. There are also other people who are who are mediums or, or channels or whatever word you want to add to it, um, who are also getting information on a spiritual level. Octarians are also involved. And the whole point is, is they want our part of the galaxy to evolve. And what's holding us back is our solar system. And what's holding back our solar system is the consciousness of humanity on the Earth. The Earth herself, as an entity, spiritual entity, wants to move into, into fourth and fifth density. But she can't yet because of, of the consciousness of humanity. And in order for her to do it without humanity, one of th two things have to happen. Humanity either has to shape up, grow up, as the Andromedans say, or humanity has to be removed and get out of the way. Cleansed. Exactly. Uh, whatever term you want to use. Um, but those options don't necessarily involve us using our free will. So that's, that's the dilemma that we have. It's like uh, we, are, we are so so entrenched in our belief systems that the reality of our belief systems is being chipped away daily, you know, to what we think is real. And uh, an overlapping degree of thoughts and energy are being introduced that hopefully will open an our perspective, enough people's perspective, to the point where we can experience a real leap in consciousness here. And we have to do this quickly. We have to do this by 2001 um, in order to really... particular month? Uh, between July and August. And what's happening... That's the that probability. What's happening between July, August, 2001? Well, basically nothing, but, you know, we're creating our future. Much of our, our future that our belief systems is being focused on the book of revelations on other prophetic disasters that are to occur so you're talking about <coughs> self-fulfilling prophecy right we're literally going to create it we're literally going to create our own demise because we're buying into belief systems that say we ourselves are not mature enough or grown up enough to take care of our own selves so we need somebody to come in here and take care of us and that's an absolute recipe for disaster um, because you know who would want to come down here and save us from ourselves? Because then they're going to have to tell us what it is that we're going to have to do. We're not taking responsibility for ourselves. Um, you know, the Andromedans say that, um, you know, the divine plan is one of freedom. Any savior that comes down here and implements a government to save us, their freedoms will be taken away from you. So that whole system of belief was part of the system of control that was set up in the first place. That's right. It's a lot of it has been uh, gray and Orion manipulations. Okay. And if you have time travel, it's very easy to go back in time and manipulate the future. It's very easy. And um, this they've done in an incredible way. You know, they haven't been here thousands of years like our government says. The Greys have really only been here 59 years. Travel capabilities, they've gone back in time and they've been able to manipulate series of histor historical events to bring us to where we are now, to where we are asking for somebody to come in and save us. And they're already here. And if we ask because of our free will, will you please save us? Well, then we've asked for it. And we've gotten exactly what it is that we deserved because we didn't take responsibility as a race to fix our own problems and to deal with our own problems. We kept looking outside of ourselves. And, you know, this is why the Andromedans are so strong about us growing up and really taking responsibility for it. Now, how many human beings are, is the Andromeda Council in contact with on Earth? I, I remember you saying at one time four. To my knowledge, they're in contact with four. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I don't know if they're more, if they're going to be more. I know there's one in the United States, there's one in South America, one in Asia, one in Europe. Um, but there are other groups that are here, you know, over 170, who may also on some level be talking to people and communicating, whether it's physical or, or um, telepathic or 
um, uh, through mediumship, you know, dealing with the different spiritual levels. Um, there's a lot of information that's being sent down here. Are they finding it's, it's effective? Is it working? To a degree, it's not working as quickly as they want, simply because most people are incredibly apathetic. Uh, they're, they're stuck in their 9 to 5. I have to make my mortgage payment. My kids got to get to school in the morning, and I don't give a damn about anything else. And unfortunately, that isn't going to work. It isn't going to save you. It isn't going to protect you. There's so much more going on here. You know, and we are just one small part of this whole picture that's going on. And we have to wake up. Period. Now, one of your contacts is a four foot 11 inch light blue skin being called Phaseus. That's correct. Please describe his or her personality in detail. Phaseus, well, he's very serious. He's very benevolent. He's, he's considered a sage. In, in his world. Um, he's an incredible healer. He has perspectives on things that are just far beyond any anything anyone that I know. Um, he's very direct. He's very humble. He's very soft. Um, uh, he's he's uh, very direct. Um, and, and when he moves into a room, like with, when I've walked with him or walked with the others, and we walk into rooms or different areas of motherships and, and, and the ships, energy changes. People, of course, they're very in touch with energy themselves. They instantly turn and they acknowledge him and they bow. Um, I guess he would be considered a, a Nishwish or a Yahweh, a, 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 an Abril, or, or, a, or I don't want to use the word God. An elder? An elder, you know, of tremendous of wisdom and insight. And... Um, but they take very seriously what is going on here. And the manipulations, the things that the Greys, the Orions, and the Reptilians are doing here. Um, uh, they're appalled with what's going on here. Um, the other one is Morane. Well, let me, Mor let me get to Morane in a second here. Uh, you mentioned directness twice. Uh, with that in mind, what was the most memorable interaction you have shared with Phaseus? They're all memorable. But I guess the single most, in, well, there's been two, one that just occurred. Um, but the prior to that, the single most important one was I had just had a contact, and uh, we had spent about an hour or so together, and I was very depressed, very sad. And as I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the ship, I was crying, and I turned around, and, and I looked at him. And he looked at me, and he smiled, and his words were, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry. That's been the most memorable one, only because of, of what that particular statement entails. Um, when we leave our physical form and, you know, what many of the uh, Catholicisms teach, you know, you're judged by God. It just simply isn't true. We judge ourselves. And, I, and what I read in that statement is that when we cross over we look at the places in our life where we withheld love, that we maybe didn't give enough. And um, we judge ourselves on that. So uh, that's, that's been the most profound one for me. And Morinay, he's a seven and a half snow white skin hairless being. Uh -huh. also, uh, he, he's light blue as well. Oh, light blue. I'm he's light blue. Uh, can you describe his or her? Oh, he. Can you describe his personality then in detail? He's serious, but he also has a really good sense of humor. Um, uh, he can snap me out of out of my depressions uh, very quickly, and he has just a different perspective on uh, uh, of looking at things. Um, he he also um, tends to be. Um, uh, part of their uh, their exploratory team. In other words, you know, when there are times when they need to defend themselves or they're confronted with something, he takes on a military type of role. Um, he's he's very very fatherly, <clears throat> big brother, big brother. Um, he's also one that you know he will he shows more emotion. He'll give you a hug or put his arm around you, um, and uh, uh, he just he's just really really wonderful in that sense. He's he's more he's more human in that sense. He's not as as sterile sometimes as Viseas, uh would, would would appear to be. It's not that they're not loving. 
but you know sometimes uh, modern day is a lot more animated you know and and I can I can um, uh, uh, relate relate more to him and I think he can relate more to the emotions that we experience here the the tremendous uh, uh, extremes that we experience. I think he's a little bit more in touch with that, you know, than, than he maybe sometimes Viseas appears to be. Now let me ask you, uh, what was the most memorable experience you've had with Mornay? I can't talk about that. <laughs> I won't talk about that. Okay. Um, now, please describe where and when you were born and your youth. That's not something I want to talk about either. Okay. In the tale... Because it's not about me, it's about the information. Okay, that's fine. In the tale, please describe your first contact at eight years of age in 1964. I didn't really know anything about it. Um, uh, I just knew that I supposedly had fallen asleep, and when I woke up it was evening. Everybody had been looking for me, and I wasn't where I was. Um, you know, and when I took him back to show him where the imprint was, uh, uh, we were playing hide and go seek, and, and uh, this was in the peninsula of Michigan, near Woodstock, Michigan. And people had been looking for me, and I wasn't there, and I got a spanking, you know, because I wasn't where I was supposed to be, and I'd been missing for hours. Um, you know, and uh, I, I didn't really know what had occurred until the second contact, which was at age 14 where I was told what had happened, that they had given me a physical, um, they had given me a suggestion to forget because of my uh, family members just simply wouldn't understand. And they were right. They were what, very right about why that. Was the, uh, why was the physical necessary? Well, they do that all the time. They do that to, all, um, to everybody to, to make sure that you're physically fit because they genuinely care about your physical health. And if there are problems, they want to make us aware of it and, and maybe offer a suggestion, you know, like maybe you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Um, some people are even experiencing healings. And it's, it's just a genuine caring for, um, of acknowledging who you are, not only on a physical level, but on a spiritual level. Now at age 14, what was the nature of that contact? I was taken out of bed, um, and I woke up and I was uh, on a table in the room, and this was my first introduction to Faseas and Morinay at least conscious introduction. And they were looking down and I did, on a soul level, experience a recognition. There was no fear whatsoever. Um, and we talked and they showed me some things about my physical self. Um, they, they also uh, uh, gave me a ball which recorded um, my entire energy field, who I was, who I've been in past lives. And as it was recording this, you know, I could see all these different images of who I'd been going across the screen and they, they saved this and um, this was put into the computer so that they would contact me and could contact me no matter where they were at any particular time that they need to. Um, I was asked if I wanted to help them. I agreed to do this, um, although at the time I didn't know exactly what it would entail. I had uh, at any time the choice to say no more. Uh, but it's been an incredible experience for me. Now, Alex, um, you, uh, I presume if you had soul recognition of them that you had had previous incarnations with them. This is true. Do you want to talk at all about any of that? No. Okay. No, everybody on the earth is from someplace else. None of us were born and hatched here. None of us as souls were created here. We've all come we all come from another time and place. My understanding is that all of the conscious spirit that's in this universe came through different black holes from other universes in time and space, which we simply aren't privy to. Um, so we, we we're, we're ancient. There's no age to us. We, we weren't created with the universe. We came through another universe, through the black holes, um, to this place that we now call our universe to continue to evolve. That's everyone. Virtually everyone. Uh, you know, that contact at age 14, was that contact um, t 
time travel in any way by the Andromedans to prepare you psychologically for your future contacts? Yes, they were all, they all, all, all the contacts is where they had to come back because they, they came here in 1980. All right. So they had to go back in time. And that's what they're, they've done with, with a lot of people. Uh, um, even the Pleiadians, to some degree, I understand, have done that, where they go back and they start preparing people early for, for uh, responsibilities they will have in the future, as opposed to hitting them all at once and saying, here you go, you know, just dumping it on your lap and you're saying, oh my God, what is this? You know, my whole reality. So there are increments of preparation that have occurred and continue to occur. And, and um, this is occurring with humanity on a whole in, in, in similar fashion, um, where information is being disseminated and little bits and pieces of ground roots people are starting to come together and really sensing change. And they're, they're, they're slowly but surely being brought to a level that when the real truth hits them, they'll be able to experience it, handle it, and, and um, assimilate it uh, for our good, you know. <clears throat> now, in 1985, your contacts with Viseas and Morney began to become more frequent. Um, please describe the nature of your contacts and the content of your discussions and the ways in which you communicate with them. We don't have enough time for that. <laughs> um, but, you know, we have put uh, together a series, uh, series one and series two, of this information. Um, in 1985, it, it really started to, uh, the information, they were physical, um, it, it evolved around uh, the greys, the earth agenda, our spirituality, religions, earth governments, um, earth history, our genetic creations, the 22 different races that have uh, actually colonized the earth at one time or another, and who we have within us genetic racial memories of, uh, within our DNA. Um, and present time, things that are occurring now, and probable, I stress, probable future events, because the future is being created every day, and it's being changed every day, um, based on our thoughts. So, I mean, just, just to sum up it, is, I, I, couldn't, I, I would need 10 hours, okay. you know, uh, that, that's not something I could very simply go into. Okay, um, yeah. But the, the series of eight, and so on and so forth, does in fact cover that. Okay. All that information. All right. Now, how does the symbol they gave you play a role in your contacts with them? Symbol. Uh, apparently, they gave you a symbol that you use oh, when you want to talk to them. Want to talk to them? It, the symbol was something that, that I chose. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, do they ever talk amongst themselves in a language you don't understand? Uh, they, they, they do, and, and it's not really a language. Um, or in the they're telepathic, and, and yes, they, they, they'll, they'll stand in circles when they're talking, and, and when, when they do talk, um, flashes of light where their third eye is, right here, different flashes of colors, colors that we don't even have on our, our third density spectrum, just appear, and, and they're just boom, 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 flashing all this color, and it's like instantaneous sentences are being just communicated, and there's some, sometimes there's nodding, sometimes there's uh, nodding this way, or sometimes up and down, sometimes, you know, there's gestures, but all the time there's just flashes, and their flashes is their, is their language. Um, it's rare. I've been privy to what it is because they happen so fast. I couldn't assimilate it. So there are then, some universal gestures then. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, all human beings are, are very animated. Do yes, they, they, they smile. They also frown, and they also look very sad when, when something is, is distressing them. So they do experience it. Um, you know, they do ex experience emotions, but not to the degree that we do. Um, uh, after they've had their discussions, one will turn to me, um, usually, uh, most of the time it's Morine, and he'll talk to me like I'm talking to you. He'll actually go to the great lengths to speak to me. Um, or sometimes it's just telepathic. You know, he'll just look at me, and, and for a while there I wasn't always getting the message because I was so focused on the color that was flashing in front. I was watching now, I was like, wow, this is really amazing. <laughs> you know, um, but then sometimes I'd have to repeat it. So, but now that kind of, that novelty has worn off, so now I, I listen to the message. Um, um, and Phaseus is almost always telepathic. Um, so that's, that's what they do. What have they asked you to do in order to help them? 
just to disseminate information. Um, I've, 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 I'm currently in the process of trying to investigate all of the current UFO information that's out there and what I've had the ability to do is to sometimes check it with them. Well, is this true? Is that true? And they've said yes or they've said no. There is a lot of disinformation out there. So what I've been trying to do is just to uh, assimilate what is real and give it from their perspective of how it affects us. Um, we have a real mess on our hands. So let's talk about some of that. According to your Andromedan sources, there are three groups of extraterrestrials who are involved in very distressing agendas here on Earth. One is the renegade grayskin Zeta Reticulans. Another is the Giza intelligence formerly of the Pleiades. And a third is the reptilians from Alpha Draconis. Is there another? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's the Orion group as well. And there's 141 of them here. And they're from Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, Rigel, and Betelgeuse, uh, from, from that particular group, that particular area of, of, of the star system. There are a lot of agendas here, hidden agendas. And um, you, you have to understand that some of the races, um, for example, the Draconids, the Draconids themselves did not evolve as a, f a life form in our universe. They were dumped here. Uh, they were brought here because they're just a pain. They're incredibly smart, they're incredibly psych uh, psychic, they're incredible builders, but they're bullies. Their whole thing is control, domination. And because there's no race in our universe that can really beat them up and wipe them out, they don't have to choose light or dark. They're just where they are. And they've chosen the opposite polarity. Um, they're, they're a tough bunch. Um, they've manipulated a lot of civilizations throughout our galaxy. Um, they're also responsible for the 600,000 year war, which almost annihilated the humankind, human species in our galaxy. And they show very little remorse about it. Uh, Hopefully they'll they'll be leaving soon. <laughs> um, but the others are life forms that have evolved, like the Orions, the Orion group. The Orion group has been uh, genetically manipulated, and have um, been deeply entrenched in Draconian belief systems. So they're carrying that that energy or that torch for whatever their agendas are, as well as their own agendas. Okay. Um, the reticulant, the greys, the greys have been also have been controlled and manipulated by the Orion group. So there is a system, a class system here um, that's been established. Um, and this is very common in, in the non-benevolent or regressive extraterrestrial structures where there's a class system of workers, warriors, uh, administrative or priests, and then the hierarchy, the royalty. Um, and the lower you are, the worse you're treated. We have a history of that here on our planet as well, right. you know, the and, and we've been taught this by the aliens themselves, right. and the Pleiadians very much were part of that as well. For a time, they were very much in that belief system. Well, let's focus for a while on the renegade Zeta Reticulans, uh, the agenda of the Grayskin Zeta Reticulans. Okay. Number one, I would like to say that, you know, there's a lot of confusion that not all Reticulans are evil. There are some reticulants that are incredible healers that are incredibly benef benevolent. Unfortunately, most of them are getting a bad rap right now because of what the greys are doing. And, and, you know, there are five different subspecies of greys. May I interject here for a moment? I, I've heard the phrase long nose gray um, describing their physical those are not Those are not the benevolent reticulants. Okay. The benevolent reticulants look like children. So the, the non-benevolent ones are the long nose Raised. That's correct. That's what I thought. That's correct. Okay. Um, and you know, there's there's a lot of information uh, that's being. Some people are experiencing real benevolent experiences with them, or they're told that they're experiencing benevolent, when in fact they really haven't. They just maybe haven't been regressed or, or taken deeply into their subconscious to know what is happening. Um, they're they're incredible masters of mind manipulation, but anyway, their race is dying. They have been so genetically altered by the Orion group that they cannot reproduce. So, 
they were told by the Orion Group to come down in here, to come in here, this is how it's been related to me, to come in here and set the stage to break down the social structures so that when the Orion Group and the Draconans come back, there are two classes, royalty and workers, which is exactly what they're doing. Did okay, you see that agenda happening right in the United exactly. States since the beginning of the Reagan well, administration? This is, this, is, this is where the focus has been. It's right. been on the United States, singly. And there's been a reason for that, which we'll cover in just a little bit, but let me get my thoughts out here. Um, which is exactly what the Grays have been told to do. And they're doing it. In the meantime, they themselves have their own agenda. They see us because of our genetic stock of having the, the DNA of 22 different races and the racial memories of trying to breed, to cross the, the, uh, the genetic bridge so that they as a race can have enough genetic stock to continue to propagate their race which according to the Andromedans, they're destined for extinction. What they're doing is not going to have any long-term effects to propagate their race. So they're desperately trying to do what it is that they're trying to do before all the other two groups get here. Um, the, the Greys also themselves want to be free from the manipulation of the Orion group. Just like we as a race want to be free of, of their manipulation. So there's this incredible triangle of, of crap that's hanging all over us you know and all these hidden agendas and, and uh, 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 just uh, brainwashing and, and bizarre belief systems that are being thrown at us you know um, when they should all leave not only the good ones and the bad ones they should all just leave and leave us alone which is ultimately what the Andromedans want um, but unfortunately that isn't going to happen right now. Uh, not until some changes occur. Um, we have to raise, so begin to raise our consciousness. Right. We need to. Right. And the first thing we need to do is we need to stop warring with each other. We need to come together as a race. And no matter what happens, we need to stop all of the political garbage and say, look, when it comes down to the bottom line, all we have is each other as a race. Period. And this is our planet, this is our home, and there's enough of us that are polluting the planet that we need to stop. Because if we don't stop polluting the planet, Rick, we're not going to have a place to live. Period. Is there an Earth quarantine that the renegade Zeta Reticulans violated? Yes. And, and what was that quarantine? The quarantine was they were supposed to, well, it's the same quarantine that evolves, that, that any other evolving planet has no intervention with an evolving race but because of our genetic stock the greys did it now but they did it in such a way that they didn't totally violate our free will you know they dangled a te technological carrot to the to the government and the government took the bait they said sure you know for their own reasons they took the bait and they there was an exchange of technology you know, and there was a, a treaty that was signed, and this is a dilemma that the Andromedan Council has. You know, if the United States military had said, go away, the Greys would have had to have left. So was this the, the Air Force Base situation, or the Eisenhower situation, where he had representatives? Is this the one that took place in the 50s? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, and this was with the Long Nose Greys then? Uh, that's true, and there, was also, there were two groups there as well, the 7th from Sirius B, who are still here, were also witnesses to this to add credence to it. Okay. So, now, and there are also, now just to add to this, uh, the Andromedans have also said that in 1933, when the Greys really first got here, that they had actually approached the Germans, and the Germans said, no, you're out of here. Uh, we already have an agreement, um, and apparently the Germans were in touch with Giza intelligence. Uh, so the Greys left. They didn't pursue it at all and they found their next opening here in the United States. Let's go uh, digress just a moment. Uh, you mentioned Sirius B. Uh, they have a relationship with the Dogon tribes of, of in Africa, correct? Is that correct? Yes, I understand that there is some, some ancestral genetic uh, connection there. Okay. And does that play a part in what's going on here on a global level, or is that just a kind of a minor I, I don't think they. I don't think at this point they give a damn about the Dogons or, or, or the humans at all. They they all have their own agendas, um, and, and the fact that the way we're being treated 
um, and the fact that there's like no support, support of government coming, support of information coming out of our government, or any truth that they even want to discuss, like just coming to the people and saying, look folks, we screwed up. We need your help. We need to raise a consciousness and start implementing the fact that they don't even want to do that. You know, tells you really, you know, where they're at. Um, uh, what I do know about the Syrians is that between Sirius A and Sirius B, there is a civil war going on there. And a lot of that, and there are also 21 other systems, there's, a, there's war going on in Perseus as we speak. Um, and 21 other star systems are also looking at the potential. And it has to do with the fact that there is now an uplifting of energy in our universe that's occurring. And the two positives, fear and love, are just banging themselves at each other. And, and the intensity is growing. Is growing every single moment. So as and we're just a microcosm of that. Now, as you're disseminating all this information to us, we should look at all this information in the spirit of love, so we don't feed any any energy into the spirit of fear. Love is the answer. That's the bottom line. Love is the answer. Love does conquer all. Love does move mountains. It can make the shifts in consciousness, but it starts number one with ourselves. You know, so that's even all this is going on around us, we just need to remember to focus on love and love of self and and and, and love of of earth, love of 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 race. That's right. Okay. That's right. Now, when did the Zeta Reticulans begin to create their genetic atrocities? Where did this take place on Earth, and what have the results been? Well, it's it's occurring everywhere. Much of it is occurring underground. Some of it's occurring in the oceans. Some of it's occurring on the moon. Some of it's occurring on Phobos, the moon of Mars. It's happening in a, in a lot of different places. Is that an artificial moon? Yes, it's yes, absolutely. It's Sol's our moon. Our moon's artificial, completely artificial. It was brought here from Ursa Minor, apparently 11, between 11 and 12,000 years ago. For the purpose of? Of being a, a satellite and a, and, a, and a base, which you know they evacuated some time ago, but it's now... Uh, of being operational again. And I covered this in, in the series of eight. Um, it came from the it came from a star system called Chata. That's for the for a word, that that's the word they use, Chata. And it was the seventeenth planet out of a, a solar system that had twenty one planets and it was one of four moons. And it was brought here. It's um it's, it is older than the Earth. There are ruins all over it. There are bases underneath it. Um, it's everything that we're told it isn't. So uh, that's that's a whole unique story unto itself. Okay, now uh, what are the results of these atrocities, these genetic atrocities, been, and are we going to begin to see more of them appearing? Well, they're, the Greys are trying to create a sub race that is a, a blend between human culture, the human race, and their race. A kind of a hybrid. Sense. Exactly. Um, they're, they're, they're not being very, very successful. Um, and one of the things that they're trying to do is they're, they're really looking for the soul. They don't understand the soul. They don't understand our, our extremes of emotions as well because they're very, very different from us. Uh, their experiments um, haven't been all that successful. There are a lot of emotional problems with that, um, with their... Um, because what really makes a human being a human being is our essence, is the spirit that animates the physical form. Well, there's also another factor, and that is that they actually feed off the energy. They're they're vampires. The, the Zeta Reticulant Greys. The, the Greys, right? They're they're vampires. Is this where we get our vampire legends? A lot of our vampire legends. I, I don't know about that. I don't know if if that has to do with it. I, I don't really know. I wouldn't be surprised to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but they feed off the energy. They can even bottle the energy and use it for later times. Um, they're also stealing the vital bodies of human beings um, uh, and storing it. So, I mean, they're just doing some really horrific things here that other races just simply wouldn't conceive of, of doing. Now, are you familiar with Salvador Frechedo? No, I never heard okay, of him. Okay, he's a gentleman who proposes, a, he's a former Jesuit pr priest who proposes the idea that Colosseum type sporting events are used to vampire energy off the crowds. I wouldn't be at all be surprised. 
It wouldn't surprise me in he the least. He said, like, the, uh, the, the sacrifice of human beings in some ancient civilizations here on Earth was uh, a form of belief system that was set up for these beings to vampire energy off of. I wouldn't be surprised at that either. Okay. Now, um, uh, war. Uh, our wars here. It's, it's, it's the exact same thing. And, and, and to all of your, your, your viewers, um, I, I'm going to give you some homework. It is an absolute must that you go out and get the book um, uh, The Gods of Eden by William Bramley. It is an excellent introductory uh, book that will bring you right up to speed with what's going on. It is, it is over 80% accurate with the information in there and I strongly suggest that people read it. It's excellent. And the 20% that isn't accurate revolves around what type of ideas? Uh, the re uh, around the, the, the soul and the being um, that we know is Jesus, okay. which I'm not going to go into. Okay. Now, how are the how are we doing on time here? Do you still have some more time? Well, it's, we've come here an hour so far. Well, we'll continue. Okay. You let me know when you okay. need to break. How are the renegade Zeta Reticulans able to manipulate Earth's most powerful governments into a position of checkmate? Oh, it's easy. That was that 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 part was was really easy. Um, number one, their technology is 2,500 years more ahead of us. Number two. Because of our greed factor, certain groups of, of power elite got it, are, are in touch with them on a physical level. Well, many of them are implanted. Many of them are so implanted that they have now become part of the gray group mind. And the Andromedans no longer consider some of these human beings, Terrans as they call us, human at all anymore. They're nothing but clones for what the grays want and they pass down orders, they tell others what to do, and of course the chain of command that we've established on our planet is exactly what's happening. Also, playing on the greed factor, those who are still human, they look at the fact that, well, they're here, they're the rulers, you know, we can still maintain our place of privilege in the world, so we'll form the new priesthood. We'll be the go-between between the workers and the gods, just like we saw in, in, in Babylon, in, in Assyria, uh, uh, Egypt, it's, it's all over again. It's re history repeating itself all over again. Because it's the control factor, the hierarchy is the, the established mode for these negative civilizations to keep their power structure intact. That's right. Okay. You know, and it's another thing, and there's also one more factor. Okay. It is about human beings out for power selling out their own race. The world club. Just selling out the rest of us, the human race, for their moment in glory, for their privilege to be with the gods, so to speak, who are, who are aliens. That's what it is. To have technology that can take them to the moon, to, to have the technology that can take them to Mars, that will give them the technology to do time travel. They totally sold out a race, our history, everything, for their brief moment in the sun. Now, pisses me off. I'm sure when they look back on their lives afterward, they'll, I would assume that they would regret their choice. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. How will the renegade Zeta Reticulans have to be removed? It's, um, well, if we can create, if humanity makes a real commitment to create an environment of unconditional love and simply refuses to hate or to kill each other and destroy our planet, they'll have to leave because they can't deal with the vibration. If we can't, it's going to take outside intervention to get them out of here. Period. Are the renegade Zeta Reticulans going to try to deceive humanity with an elaborate religious event they are staging? The, the, the perceived second coming, yes. Uh, I have been told to really beware of that that they are very capable of playing out the second coming, creating a, a, a clone who will look like the image on the Shroud of Turin, uh, which, by the way, was, was, a, which was, was one of their deals. Um, and this soul will have holographic imprints uh, and information regarding all the world's religions. He won't have a soul. And yes, I mean, we've been led down this path of the book of revelations that this is God's word this is the way it has to happen and you know what God didn't write the Bible man wrote the Bible period ETs didn't write the Bible but some ETs did tell 
those souls, those men, what to write. And we have been led down this path where we com totally will succumb our free will to become subservient. And I'm not here to offend anybody, but really think about it. Really think about, you know, what we've done and, and what our history has been. You know, we've been to this place so many times before, and we still haven't gotten it right. You know, and, and we're still not going to get it right unless we do it as a race and just cut out all the crap. Period. Now, um, th that, that leads me, I'm going to jump a question. Do they have control of the world media? Agreed does. Agreed does. <laughs> but I, a lot of the I don't know if it's them I'm themselves. Well, the, the, the programming is being introduced, and it is mankind that is introducing it to the so masses. So it's, it's the people that are selling out. Basically. That's that's it. That's okay. it's the new priesthood. Okay. You know that's where the responsibility lies. What would be the outcome if human beings believe that uh, re renegade Zeta Reticulans were the hope of mankind? We would know a tyranny and an enslavement that is far beyond anything we could even imagine. To put it just quite bluntly, we'll get. S <laughs> um, we'll never be free again. We'll never be free again. We will be stuck uh, until we're rescued by an outside force. We ourselves will not be able to break free. That's the bottom line. And right now, we have an opportunity. There is a window of time for us to break free, to do it ourselves, to really make this incredible leap ourselves so that we can have the benefit of taking responsibility for it. Now, in that passion that you talk with right there, that passion that we have, if we want to break free, should be manifested into the spirit of love? Yeah, love. That's the bottom line. It's brotherhood. It's knowing that, hey, you know, we're a race. It doesn't matter the color of our skin. We are a race. And we're being messed with in, in a big way. We're being manipulated in an incredibly aud uh, audacious. audacious way. Uh, they're just mocking how stupid we are when we're really not stupid. You know, but nobody will tell the truth. Nobody will come out and say, hey, you know, this, none of this is right. We would have never meant to live this way. And they had no right to come down here and, and mess with us the way they've done that. You know, and, and the real strength in us, in our, our own permanent evolvement as a race, will come from us standing up, taking a stand and saying, you know what, no way, we're not going to do this. We're not going to destroy ourselves for your enjoyment so you can feed off of us. You know, you have no right to, to, us to, to manipulate our governments, you know, uh, to create wars. None of this was right. And that's it. We're gonna, we need to stand up as a race, exercise our free will and say, you know what, we don't want to live this way anymore. We want to create a real future where our kids will have an opportunity to be whatever they want to live in an environment that's, that's, that's clean, that's free, where they can have water to drink, where they can go out and eat fruit, where they can play in the dirt without getting radioactively toxic. All of this so stuff that we're doing to ourselves. So the people with weapons are the police, the military people. These people need to be persuaded and persuade them themselves that they can lay down their weapons, that they don't need to use them against other human beings, that they can love other human beings, interact with, with them with, without a violence or power control uh, type of situation going on. I, I'm not saying that there aren't some human beings here that definitely don't have some serious problems. I'm not saying that at all. There are some who do. But the bottom line is, when you, when you look at the whole picture and you go up the ladder, okay, we are not the enemy. The enemy isn't human at all. But it's pushing all our buttons so that we're so busy looking at each other and so so um, uh, neurotic about each other that we're not looking at the real the real reality here, the real cause, which is another race or races that are here who are totally playing games with us, feeding off our energy and hoping that we destroy ourselves so that they can keep the planet And themselves. really, let's, let's say who it is again, it's the Orion Group. It's the Orion Group. It's a group that is on its way here now from Alpha Draconis. They're the real culprits behind this whole deal. 
Um, Alpha and, Draconis and or Orion or both those? Alpha things? Draconis. They're the real culprits behind this whole thing. Above the Orion, above the Orion group? Yes. Okay. Yes. So then, there's Orion, then there's Orion. Then there's Orion, the Orion group. Then you've got uh, the Greys. And where did the, the Giza intelligence fit in here? Uh, they were just a, a group. They were totally independent. They came in and did their own thing. Uh, they were perceived as gods, and they played the role out. And they got stuck in it. You know, they got stuck in the ego part of it. We're gods. We can do this. We have all this technology. And they just played it out for all that it was worth. Okay. Uh, you know, and, but to be honest with you, at this point, they're not really much of a factor anymore. You know, Giza intelligence. They're not much of a factor at all anymore. What should a human being do if they encounter a renegade Zeta Reticulin? What would your advice be? Stand in their truth. If you can't run, stand in your truth. And just look them, look at them. If they try to project their head and their thoughts into your head, you just stand firm with who you are, and you say, "No, you are not coming into my head. You are not taking me over, and you are not, not going to violate my free will. I don't give a damn who you are. Leave me alone. Period. Because if it's a benevolent, they will not try to do it. They will not try to take you over. They will not try to to put crap into your head so they can feed off of your fear. Period." Excellent. Okay, I'm going to skip the keys of intelligence for the moment then, and we'll go to the Alpha Dracon. Can we, can we take a short time? Oh, out? definitely. Thank you. You know, Rick, I, there's something else I want I to stress here, and that is, and this is something that, that the Andromedans have really stressed. There is no race any better than us. Just because they're different, just because they're more evolved, doesn't mean that they're better. We are equal. We're just not maybe as aware as they are. But that doesn't mean that any race is any better or any less. In fact, we're all equal. So we should just not worship anybody? Hell, no, absolutely not. That's how we got into this mess in the first place. Right. Um, that, 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 abso if you want to worship somebody, worship the God within you. That's it. Worship no one else. And if you're going to have a tyrant in your life, let it be that part of you that's critical of you. Let that be your only tyrant. Don't give anybody else any power outside of your physical form to be a tyrant, to control you, or manipulate you in any way. Be yourself. Because if you are yourself, you're a part of God, and that part of you knows what to do. It knows the right way to live. And, you know, and this is really interesting. Because of our genetic makeup, the 22 different races and, and all of the DNA and the racial memories that we have and the genetics that we have because of the fact that we are spirit do you know and this is an incredible thing do you know that the Andromedans actually consider us royalty they consider us royalty we obviously aren't acting like royalty but we're the only ones in our galaxy that can make the claim to having the genetics that we have and the possibilities and the capabilities of doing what we can do as a race. We're the only ones. They actually consider every single one of us royalty. Now, think about that. I guess all beings that, that would try and, and uh, be spiritual and raise their spirituality in, in essence would be royalty. Yeah. I, I guess. I suppose that's true. Talk a little bit about the the ringleaders then of this whole orchestration that's <laughs> going here on Earth. According to your Andromedan sources, there are okay, 22 races originally colonized the Earth. The first race being the reptilians from Alpha Draconis. What was the nature of their colony here? Well, they're Hyperborean. Basically, they're explorers, and uh, they're also genetic engineers. They would just colonize, they would take samples, they would hang a flag and say, this belongs to us, just like we did with the moon, you know, but so we, we weren't the first ones there. Um, they, they, exactly what, what, what we've done, they were explorers. And they would just go to a place, they would see what was there, they would explore it, if there were minerals that they needed, if there were other life forms, organisms, whatever it was that they needed, they took, and then when it was done, they had enough, they moved on, and just kept exploring and expanding. Their, their realm of exploration or territory. And you said they were dumped here. Originally, right. originally they were. Right. They were dumped in Alpha Draconis 
Nobody knows exactly where they came from, and my understanding is that even in their ancient history, they don't know exactly where they came from. Um, but they uh, they were left in Alpha Draconis because that particular system offered them the highest probability of survival. And from there, they were able to create craft, space travel. I mean, they're magnificent in what they did, and they're to be commended for what they did. But the fact that they need to control and dominate and manipulate to the degree, sorry, I have a problem with that. And so does half, half of the other of the, of the galaxy. Um, that's just the way they are. They're the biggest bully. Nobody can beat them up or wipe them out, so therefore they have no motivation to change. So that's the space they hold. And, you know, the Andromedans actually consider them the ultimate warriors, which says a lot, you know, uh, for whatever reasons. A lot of uh, bullies end up destroying themselves. Well, that's, um, that's something that r may possibly need to happen, we hope soon. Or I hope so, you know, because we need to be free. We need we need to have our shackles that we've been been put put around us let go of, so that we can really evolve. And you know, we have awesome potential. We really do. Uh, we have been as a race. We have been through so much here. We have so much experiences, you know. And because of our emotions, which is really our strength, which really sets us apart from all the other races out there, even the other human races. You know, we have tremendous capabilities to, to create things. And, um, you know, but, but we, we need to get clear of what's real and what isn't. You know, we also need to get really clear about being able to create our own future, to create our own reality. And I'd have somebody say, well, that doesn't work for me, so you're going to have to do this. You know, or play God and ruler over us. You know, sense of responsibility is right. so important it, in all of this. It's, it's, with any sense of power, with, with any knowledge, comes responsibility. That's exactly right. And the divine plan is one of freedom. Free expression. Free expression, free expression, free expression. It is not one where they want to implant us and they say, you are going to be a worker, you're going to be this, you're going to be that. Sorry, that's not what it's all about. And if anybody tries to force that stuff down your throat, fight it. Okay, so the Andromedans tell you that the Alpha Draconians are here now. Where? There are 1,833 of them that have been living underground between 100 and 200 miles beneath the surface. They've been here, some of them have been here a long, long time. They have lifespans that are thousands of years. Uh, uh, they're carnivorous. They are not friendly to mankind, um, at least the ones that are here. Are you saying carnivorous, they eat humans? Yes. And they need to be, they won't eat a dead human, it has to be alive at the time of the killing. Their preference is children. You know, and we've been told, we've been told, you shouldn't talk about that. You know, there are, uh, other people say, well, you better not talk about the reptilians. Well, you know, uh, bull, you know, uh, why not? According to the Andromedans, they're responsible for 31,712 children disappearing in the last 25 years from the United States. These children were food. And I'm supposed to just shut up and not say anything about it because people don't want to hear it? That's tough. That's tough. You know, Westchester County, in the last five years, 3,000 children in Westchester County, New York, have vanished without a trace. Where are they going? Why are we allowing this to happen? How and why should people... Stay in denial about. Now, how are they able to do this? How are they able? To, how are they able to? How are they able to do it? How are they able to come up out of this from underground and do it? Or do they have? There are tunneling systems working? everywhere. They're being helped by the Greys, and also there are groups within the higher echelon that are actually helping them acquire this. So human beings are abducting the kids and giving them to the Greys to in turn give them to the Alpha Draconians. That's right. That's part of the deal. They won't come up as long as we feed them down there. You understand? It's about human beings selling themselves out. The echelon attitude here, the needs of the few outweigh the needs of humanity. And sorry, that just isn't right. You know, but it's going to have to be humanity that's going to rise up and take the stand. You're just going to have to turn off your televisions. They're going to have to get in their car. They're going to have to fire everybody in Washington, D.C. that knows and does nothing. And they're going to have to do something. You know, this apathy's got to end, otherwise the way we live is going to end. Period.
I mean, that's the bottom line. You know, and I'm not coming from a fear space. I'm really quite angry about the apathy and the fact that, you know, when people give lectures and try to tell this, people want to stand up and fight with them. Look at what's happening around us. The indications are everywhere. Everywhere. The truth is now an obscure thing. You know, the lie is the norm. There's something wrong here. What's wrong with this picture? Sorry, I'm getting crazy. No, you're not. You're, you're expressing frustration, I think. Hi. Uh, why are the... Why... Aside from the carnivorous aspect to the Alpha Draconians, why else are they dangerous to humanity? Because they don't like us. And what are they willing to do with humanity? Eat us. There's no need for us. I mean, look look at where we are. Look at us right now as a civilization, as a society. Okay? They don't need anything. They have all this technology that they want. We can't really offer them except maybe work, do some work for them. But they don't need all of us to work for them. They don't respect human life in any way whatsoever. Um, and this goes back to Lyra, to where the original war started. Um, they... When they got to Lyra originally, they saw this, this human race that was plentiful in food, that could grow food, that could do all of these agricultural things. And mankind at, on a whole is really agricultural. We're really, we really, as a race, if we were left alone, would be nurturing the earth. We were living in tribal communities like the Native American Indians did. Um, you know, that's really, that's really our, our essence, our nature, I'm sorry. That's really our nature, our essence. And, um, you know, the cities and, and, and the culture that we're living in now has totally cut us off from the land, from who, what our real essence is, which is nature. And, um, I, you know, we're starting to feed off each other now. Um, I, it's, it's like so bizarre. You know, I can't... It's like when I see the Andromedans or, or when I've been exposed to the Pleiadians, when I see how they... Lo they live and, and, and they teach and they, they live with each other and they respect each other and I come here it's like you know it reminds me of that sentence that, that Abraham Lincoln that, that quote that Abraham Lincoln once said you know when I'm, when I'm if you are above the earth looking down you could be an atheist but when I'm on the earth looking up and seeing the heavens I, I know there's a God it's like the duality and I think enough of us more of us really need, need to start taking the perspective that what we're doing here isn't right. Um, you know, we, we, we need to get in touch with, with what's out there, um, with just the, the whole idea that, God, how did we get here? What makes me be here? You know, as opposed to going home after work, turning on TV, watching three hours of television, going to bed, getting up the next morning, going to work, and doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, like robots. Throw the televisions away. Just throw them away. Okay, uh, what are the physical characteristics of the Alpha Draconians? What do they look like? Uh, do we? I don't have that. Maybe it's in the car. <laughs> um, they're ugly. I mean, they think we're ugly, too. You know, and I guess it's all a matter of perspective and belief system. In my belief system, and I'm only taking responsibility for me, they're ugly. They're anywhere from 7 to 22 feet tall. They can weigh up to 1,800 pounds. They're reptilian. The, roi uh, the longer, the, s the ones that have stubby tails, if you see one that has no tail, he's, he's of the warrior class or, or the worker class. The longer the tail, the higher their rank. When you see one with long tails, with, with winged appendages, he's considered royalty. Whenever you see one, you ought to just run like hell. You shouldn't approach it. You shouldn't provoke it. Just get the hell out of its way just get out of its way. Just run. You know, um, there is a way to kill them. If you can't cut off their head, they have two hearts. There's one here underneath this armpit and one here. Or if you can't get to that area and you need to slow it down, you need to hit it right above its groin area. It has a very large liver. You need to wound it there to slow it down. Um, it is not something where man-to-man -man combat you're going to be able to, to deal with. 
because they apparently have the strength of, of 12, 15 men. They're incredibly quick. They're incredibly psychic. They know what you're going to do before you do it. Um, and, and, you know, if they get here in mass, we got real problems. Real problems. Uh, what did the Andromedans advise human beings to do if they encounter an Alpha Draconian? To, to leave. You leave its space. Get away. To get away. What if they can't? Then they can't. And if they can't? Uh, they'll usually be killed. And what do they have the Andromedans said? spoken in any detail about what a human being should do if they are in that position? For karmic purposes? For that, look, that, 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 that's, that's not karmic at all. Or a lot or of this, you know, all this metaphysical stuff, or you know, where you chose to be here, a lot of, you know, in some situations that's true. Uh -huh. When you're creating your reality and in your space, but when you're being invaded, that's not karma. That's a violation of free will. You know, if your um, free will is being violated, Alex, what should you do? You should you should ask for help. Okay. Ask for help. Put a call up to God. Put a call up to heaven. Put a call to the Andromedans, the Pleiadians, whomever. Just put a call up, and and just and deal with it. You know, I don't know. Um, I mean, that's just the nature of, of of the beast. They don't like us. We're we're considered a food source for them. For them. You know, we're a food source for the greys, but in an entirely different way. Have they taught us to be carnivorous through the, the belief systems? Have yep. they taught us to eat meat and eat eat flesh? Uh-huh. Well, it lowers the body's vibration. It lowers the body's vibration. So, if, if our body vibrated at a higher length, we would spiritually be evolving regardless of what our religions were teaching us. And they can't have that. They can't have us being free. So they can't us not being in control because then we're responsible for ourselves. So as we move away from eating meat and more towards vegetarianism, um, we we begin to raise our vibrational level and be and and break this cycle. It helps. Not everybody has to stop eating meat. It's not an absolute requirement. It certainly helps. But some people's belief systems will be that they just need a piece of meat. And for whatever their reasons are, that's fine. If you want to eat meat, that's fine. But you know what? Feed your mind. Feed your mind with, with, with spirit, with questions about existence, about what it is we're doing here, why we're here, what the hell is really going on. Why is it that I have all these material things and I'm still miserable in my life? Well, you know, I know that a lot of people with questions, where are some of the truthful answers? You mentioned one book, The Gods of Eden, that you felt really strongly about. What, what other sources are there that you feel that we have access to, aside from our inner selves, which is actually the best place to probably begin looking, but are there, are there other starting points that people can use that y you know of? I mentioned Gods of Eden. Uh, George Andrews' books, um, ETs Among Us. There's a lot of information in there that not only deals with the ETs, but also the world political government which right now is very dangerous for humanity because it's part of the great plan. It's part of, the, uh, of their regressive alien plan to, to keep us in jail. Okay, do not pass go, but keep us in jail. Um, oh God, suddenly I draw a blank. Okay, just um, as you think about it, interject it into right. the conversation. Okay. You mentioned throw the television out. Are television programs conditioning our youth into accepting these hostile beings, do you think? Or is that just human hey, beings doing hey, anything for a buck? I, you know, I don't necessarily know. I don't know, what, you know, but, but I, the violence is desensitizing. You know, it, violence is just a way of life now. We've been taught that. We've been um, uh, programmed that violence is just a way of life. So when we see really violent acts, oh, oh, that's too bad. Well, you know, honey, what's on Channel 7? Or what movie are we going to rent tonight? You know, uh, that's, that's what it's come to. And it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. There is no reason that any, any of this has to occur at all. It really doesn't.
and it's and it is and it, a lot of it is the responsibility of the people because if the producers and Hollywood are going to make movies like this and we're going to go and buy the tickets well they're going to be motivated for the buck to continue to make these kind of movies where if they spend 20 million dollars and nobody buys a ticket they won't be making those kind of movies so it comes back to people taking personal responsibility for what they think, what they want to believe, and what it is that they want to create. Do the Andromedans really feel that we'll be able to reach that window? Right now it's undecided. And that's the scary part. They don't know. What would help push it forward? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, except for just, you know, start listening to, to people that are talking start really paying attention to what's going on. Um, you know, my grandfather used to have a saying, believe nothing that you hear in half of what you see. You know, uh, I wouldn't believe a thing that comes out of Washington, D.C. In fact, it's my own personal belief that this, this next election um, that's coming up next year in November, that every American should march on Washington, D.C. and should fire every single person that's there. They have run this country into the ground. They have totally sold us out to the to the United Nations um, for a buck, you know, for the debt. And, you know, even the monetary system, it's just a belief system. We could change that tomorrow if we wanted to. I mean, we're so intelligent. We could create something different, you know, but we're believers. Oh, we've got to have this money. Do you know that we're the only race, the only race in our galaxy where people starve, that people are homeless? Um... I mean, it's just, it's such bull. It, it doesn't have to be like this. If you're alive and you're on a planet and other civilizations, even the draconian races, they take care of their own. They don't sell out each other like we do here. They don't throw somebody in the street because they don't have a, a paper, which is really what it is. You know, the only value on it is what we believe it is. They just don't have that. You know, they don't let children starve. They don't feed grain to cattle that feed 20% of the population and let other, the other 25% that need the grain starve. They, it's unconscionable. They would never even think to do that. But we do it here. Four bucks. For money. For power. That's part of that condition process that's been going on 5,700 years. That's part of it. But the responsibility is that there are people that know what's going on and they play the game anyway. They don't have the courage to say, look folks, let's deal with the realities here. You know, we don't have a guy that's strong enough in, in office as president to stand up and say, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, we've really been sold out. That there are forces within our government, like what Kennedy tried to do, that just flat out want to destroy the United States because we're too good, because we have too much. Instead of raising the consciousness and, and, and the... And the uh, life, um, everyday life, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A standard of living. Of the rep, with, of, uh, instead of raising the standard of living that we have um, globally. To, globally, they would rather just destroy the United States, or destroy our, 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 our standard of living, so that we're comparable to everybody else. So now, everywhere is a third world nation. And that's exactly what they're doing. And they're doing it for power for greed, we're selling out our own, and it's just... It's, something's got to be done. Could you describe the human military bases on the dark side of the moon, Mars, and the Mars probes as Andromedans, and how the Alpha Draconians fit into this scenario? The Mars probes, the Russian and the US one, they're gone. They were destroyed. They're history. There's no secret here about, well, it, it's taking pictures privately. Um, you know, and it doesn't matter whether you believe that or not, it's history. Okay, uh, March of 89, the Russians took pictures, Mars was invaded, we had a human colony there of 300,000, so I'm told. Uh, one was underground, one was above ground, Adam and Eve. They are conquered, they're being taken over. The human beings that are from Earth, that volunteered or were kidnapped to go there, are in, are in deep trouble. Many of them have already been eaten. Some of them have already been killed. There is nothing we can do here as a race to help them. So that, that was, Mars was conquered by the Alpha Draconians? That's right. They came in. There's 100,000 of them there. 
They have approximately 2,111 ship scout craft there. They're in an area underground that is 64 square miles, known on Mars as the area of Tempe Terra. That's where their base is. It's an ancient base that they had. Uh, it's over a million years old, and the last time it was it was um, in full bloom was 317,000 years ago. Now, if we begin to train all our telescopes on that, are we going to be able to see activity going on there? I suppose that we would. I, I have a feeling that they already are seeing incredible amounts of activity, but they're not allowed to say it. They're just not allowed to say it. Nor who's who's going to want to jeopardize going to jail, being ridiculed, being fired, giving up everything they have to come up and say, well, I'm, a, I'm an astronomer, and I was looking at Mars, and I saw alien craft, and I know there's a base there, and it's being conquered by reptilian aliens. Who's going to have the guts to come up and say it? Somebody's Nobody in the power to. elite. Nobody wants to blow their mortgage. But somebody's going to have to, right? So, well, yes, but eventually. It's going to be too late by the time they do it. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. And, so, and, and that's exactly what the Andromedans are thinking. You see, you know, there are people probably saying, well, God, why don't they just come down and save us? There's a lot to that. Number one, if we're rescued, we don't permanently evolve ourselves. Number two, we won't take responsibility. If something goes wrong, we can always blame it on them. Number three, it doesn't just change our reality, it changes their reality as well. Number four, the Andromedans and most of the other benevolent races, they don't want to have to come down here and babysit. Us? That's not their job. It's not their job at all. Now, in the way you told me... That and number four, and, and I'm sorry, and, and number five, let me just add this. Look at how we've treated our Earth. Look at how we've trashed it ourselves. You know, they're like, you know, why should we come down here and help you when you don't want to even help yourself? Or even make the effort? You know, uh, the cleaning up the planet, we're giving to government bureaucracies. Well, we'll here's $3 billion here. There's $10 billion there. Here's the super fund to clean up toxic waste, $20 billion. 20 billion dollars and, and the place is getting worse you know that's not the problem the problem is on an individual level on an individual basis just don't create plutonium anymore just don't create styrofoam anymore just tell the industries the corporations because we're the ones who control it we're the ones buying the products we won't buy it unless you fix it end of story period we need to change it it's our planet we are the bulk of humanity. It isn't the corporations, it isn't the Fortune 500, it isn't the Committee for 300, and it isn't the Trilateral. We could fire all of them if we had to. Period. But it, it's, it's, it's coming together and it's doing something about it. And it's going to have to be grassroots, and people are going to have to start doing it soon. Are these leaders going to, if we do raise up and do a grassroots uprising, when they order the military to quell that like they do at Kent State or any other political demonstration? They probably will try. They probably will try. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But you know what? Let's take, a, let's take an example of the American Revolutionary War. 4% of the population of the colonies actually rose up and fought the British. Only 4%. The rest stayed home, stayed in the pubs, drinking ale, doing whatever, and waited to see who would end the war, to see who would win. And then when we won, everybody wanted to take credit for it. But it was really only 4%. Those heroes. And those 4% changed the face of the world. Well, 210, 12 years, whatever it is now, we're, we're right back at the same place where we're being called to do exactly the same thing. But the paradox here, Alex, would be then that if we begin to war against ourselves, that's going to exactly fuel the whole fire that's going on. Maybe for a brief time it would. Until one side surrendered. Or saw the light. You know, do you know much about the New World Order? Do you know that they're building concentration camps to put millions of people in? Do you know that the United Nations has got 300,000 troops in the United States right now that they're going to use to confiscate weapons and they're selling our active military troops, sending our active military troops out of the United States so they won't be here when this happens? Are you aware that that's going on? Do you know that just off the coast, of, uh, just south of the border in Veracruz, there are 300 
tons of Soviet military equipment ready to invade. I mean, th this is uh, that there are states actually wanting Regions? to succeed from the from the Union. Yes. Yes, there are seven different, there are nine different regions. The United States is being, has already been designated to be split up. They're getting ready to, to, dis, to, to totally dismantle the United States of America. And you know, the only real part of the United States of America, and I get so angry with this, is Washington, D.C., 68 square miles. That's really all it is the United States. We are in the Republic of Arizona. People in California are in the Republic of California. It is those separate republics that make up a United States. Washington, D.C. has totally manipulated everything. We don't, we're no longer the United States with the forefathers founded. It isn't that at all. And, and you know, in 1992, um, the, United, the Congress approved the U.N. Charter. Well, what people aren't aware of, because it wasn't printed in the press, in the newspapers, in our controlled media, is that because it's a treaty, it supersedes the Constitution of the United States. The UN Charter is now the law of the land, not the Constitution anymore. And in the UN Treaty, Articles 55 and number and 56, look it up, folks, prove me wrong, state that the United States Congress no longer abides by the, and has to abide by the U.S. Constitution. As, as of 1992, the United States of America ceases to exist. They just haven't told the people yet. And they're not going to tell them until after they have outlawed all weapons, after they have totally regulated the Second Amendment and taken everybody's firearms away so you can't fight, so you can't stand there and be free anymore. This is all part of the plan. This is, this is why the Andromedans are so strong about trying to make the awareness here in the United States, because not only does it control media, but there are some incredibly strong spiritual essences here, people here, you know, and we did this no less than 200 years ago, and many of the souls that were there then have incarnated again, and they're here. Jefferson is alive, the soul. Franklin's alive. Kennedy's back. Uh, Bobby Kennedy's back. Martin Luther King. Uh, Andrew Jackson, they're Lincoln, they're all back in physical form. They've all incarnated, they're all here in the United States. Um, because uh, right now, this is, this, this is where the, the battle is, between light and dark. You've got the greys over us, you've got the reptilians underneath us, and between us you've got humanity of the human uh, you've got the American people, I mean all of the world, but you've got humanity sandwiched in the middle wondering what the hell is going on here. Whew. Let's talk for another ten more minutes. Okay. What is the ultimate agenda then of the Alpha Draconians in relation to Earth and to this part of the galaxy? They, they do not want our galaxy to move into fourth and fifth density of uh, consciousness because they lose complete power. But it will anyway, won't it? Not necessarily. There are no guarantees. There are no guarantees. Uh, there's no guarantee that Earth is going to go into fourth or fifth density. There's no guarantees that the entire galaxy is going to get there. Because if that were the case, they would probably just leave us alone and not give a damn what was happening here. No. You see, the, the Draconans are third density. They're physical just like us. They can only move into fourth density by mechanical means. If we move into fourth and fifth density, they've lost their playground. They've lost control of what they want to control. So they're fighting like hell trying to hold everything back. Because if they can hold everything back, then again, it's a, it's a form of power, of control. Now, how it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, God, it's such a mess. Alex, how do the Andromedans plan to remove the Alpha Draconians? And you said they're the bullies are the strongest. They uh, can can they not be? Apparently, ready? apparently, the universe has created its own way of doing that, and maybe this is a good place to end. In the beginning, uh, and here's the history of our universe, where it was created. The Big Bang theory is essentially right in its simplicity, but apparently, what happened was, um, as as vibrations, as the universe starts to excel in light, this way. There are pockets, and you have to look at it as, as a holograph, holographic projection of light. 
when you put a shadow into a light, it creates a, a variance of the light. Well, apparently what happens is, is things that don't um, ascend or choose to take higher consciousness, they get very, very heavy in weight or in light, whatever you want to call it. And as everything starts to exceed up, bulges, dips in light are created, in frequency are created. And what happens is negativity forms because of its weight, its heaviness, forms into these pockets. Well, what happens is they form a sack. And eventually what happens is that those sacks break. And because everything is spirit and nothing is ever wasted, they form, when they explode, they, they cast themselves out and they form another universe. They create a space for them to continue. Well, that's how our black holes are. That's how they were formed. Those black holes, if we could get through them, would be to another universe. They're portals. And it would just explode out. Well, that's how our universe was created. Well, because of this new energy that's being, um, that's being formed, pockets are, of resistance are now being formed all through, the, all through the universe. And in our galaxy, it's, it's right now between us and Cirrus. So the way that the Andromeda's plan to remove the Alpha Draconians would be is basically to try to contain them and and the en their own energy themselves will suck them into a place of darkness so they can move out into another place. The Greys, the Orion groups, this is going to happen. It's happened before. Um, they know it's happening now and this is why everybody feels this intense energy. Things are suddenly really starting to increase and, and it's simply because it is increasing. So at a prior um, time, then, they were sucked out of another universe into Alpha Draconis? Is that basically what, essentially what happened? They were sucked from wherever they were into another universe. How somehow that universe, or the beings in that universe, wherever they came from, said, we've got to get rid of these guys, and they literally brought them here from their universe and dumped them and said, boom, this is where you are. Because they came here in physical form, which means they had to have been brought here they didn't evolve like every all the other life forms here have evolved. They were brought here in full physical form, which means they were created someplace else and dumped here and said, you know, your history. Well, someplace else, then, there's some very irresponsible people. Yeah, well, I, you know, maybe at some point in our eternal history we'll be able to address that issue. You know, But for right now, we need to address our own issues. Okay, let's go to the World Club then to end this up um, and future events. According to the Andromedans, mankind has been manipulated for 5,724 years. Human agents must have participated in this throughout history. Who are some of the major players in this deception? You mentioned Hitler and the Giza intelligence. Uh, Most of the pharaohs. Um, most of the ancient Egyptian gods. Um, I mean, there's so many. I, I, I couldn't honestly tell you. I mean, history is chock full of it. Uh, I think what people need to do is to go back and look at what we call mythology and really start giving it a second look. Uh, uh, Richard, Richard Thompson, in his book, although I've not read it, but I've heard others talk about where he, he, does, he delves into the history of things. Um, now, and, and it's also important to remember that just because it's history doesn't mean it's accurate history. You know, because it, it has been proven over and over and over again, whoever wins the war rewrites history. They write it to their benefit, to glorify themselves. And it doesn't mean that that's, that's really what happened. And according to the Andromedans, our next major leaps in consciousness are going to come from science and archaeology. It isn't going to come from any spiritual leader or teachings. It's going to come from someone to say, you know what, this, here's the proof, this is true, this is reality, and I don't know what this stuff is, we can't prove that. You know, and, okay. it, and it's time we really start paying attention. Okay. Maybe at a future time we can, okay. we, can, we can share more or do another interview or something. In a specific way, please describe in detail what the World Club is and who comprises it and offer some specific examples of how they're controlling the rest of us. Um, well, the banking circles maybe. Yeah, it's all it all evolves around money. The World Bank, International Monetary Fund. I mean, they've got the whole world in debt. You know, governments are giving away their their mineral rights in perpetuity. The United States government is in, is now in a position to declare uh, a national state of emergency, suspend the Constitution of the United States, and nationalize. 
And the reason they, they will have to nationalize is because our debt far exceeds any ability to pay it back. So who are the collectors? What countries are the collectors? It's not a country. It's a group of men. It's a group of human beings. It's a group of human beings. Right. The aliens don't need money. They don't need an American Express card. So if, you know, uh, if, if the rest it's, it's a man-made thing. If, you know? if the rest of us simply say, we're not paying back the debt, that's it, we're starting over, you can forget your whole system, then we can erase that whole thing and start over. That's right. If we had a real president in office, and Kennedy was probably really the last one, what he should do is just go on TV and spell it all out. Surround himself with people that maybe he can trust to protect his life, you should get on television you should, um, before Congress and all the houses, the House of Representatives, in front of everybody, and spend three hours and give everybody a real education. Number one, the Federal Reserve is private. Number two, our debt isn't real. Number three, our, 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 we've gotten ourselves into this big mess because past presidents sold us out for comfort and for money. Um, and, and apologize. And then what you ought to tell you know, and just say that I'm nationalizing all the banks under the United States Treasury. We're going back to a silver standard, just like the Constitution says, and give everybody an opportunity to to get back on track here. You know, to maintain our standard of living and just start healing. You know, and then the next thing I would say is, or make sure if there were any POWs alive, that they came back home, and I would start healing all of that crap. The fact that you know that our POWs were sold out because of a debt, because of $3 billion, when we've wasted $3 billion or a promise to Vietnam, when we've wasted that kind of money on, on such stupid things as, as studying the, the sexual habits of a, of a tsetse fly or, or, or a frog's mating, I mean, it's just it's unconscionable that we've allowed our government to do this. Alex, we've got about five minutes left. I, I want... Let's see if we can do some real brief answers to some of these last couple things, just real brief. Um, the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union, according to your sources, have been building secret technologies and bases on Earth, the Moon, and Mars for some time. Where are these bases to be found on the Moon? Where are they? Yeah. They're on the dark side. And wh do you know what the locations are, what they're called? Um, yes. Um, one is under Jules Verne. God, I wish I had those notes in front of me. Um, let's come back to that. Okay. Let's Have they told to you anything about Area 51 or Dulce, New Mexico? Um, yeah, there there were a lot of stuff there. Uh, the actual underground base is not underneath uh, Arcalada Mesa. It's actually 20 miles to the northwest. That's just an entrance point in and out. This is Area 51. This is no. This is in, in New Mexico, Dulce. Dulce okay. um, it's not exactly right there. Um, as far as Area 51, yes, there's a lot of stuff that was going on there, but a lot of that has been moved, and it's now in New Mexico, uh, in the Sandia, underneath the Sandia Laboratory. Uh, Diego Garcia Island. Diego Garcia Island, there's a base there, Pine Gap. Diego Garcia Island, there's uh, anti-gravity anomalies there, and this is how they were able to, to blow a lot of equipment into, into space without using rockets, and then they would have the UFO type craft which we built from technology we were given. Um, they would hook a tow chain to it and like a tow barge, just tow it to the moon. Okay, and, you mentioned and, it's, and it runs, and the equipment that's there is run on free energy, stuff that was built in the night, that was created in the 1920s that we've been absolutely not privy to. We haven't had to pump one gallon of oil out of the ground since, 19, since the late 1920s. They've had free energy, but because of money, be controlled. They've allowed us to pollute the environment, to devastate the oceans because of petroleum products when we don't need it for money. Which brings us briefly to alternative four. When 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 the Martian base fell, because be, okay, when the Martian base fell, the new the world government, the, those elite, figured out well we don't have any place to go now. The moon is not set up for long-term habitation, where Mars is and could be. So what happened was, when it fell and they knew we couldn't get there, they figured, well, we've got to do something about here, because we have nowhere else to go. So I was told by the Andromedans that these, 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 these men who think they're God had to come up with another alternative, which was they thought that they could create a controlled polar shift. 
by detonating nuclear weapons or cobalt weapons underneath the south polar ice cap, causing it to slip, which would cause the poles to slip. To slip. And within a 24-hour period, you would completely drown 83 to 85 percent of the population. So the Andromedans said that they will not allow. It isn't going to happen. If the Earth is going to do it, it'll be done on, by her will, on a natural, in a natural way, and that is a possibility in our future. What is the primary message of the Andromedans? Grow up now. Open your eyes. Open your ears. Take responsibility for your life. Take responsibility for your planet and realize this is your home, this is your race, and that if you, if you are sincere in making the effort to evolve, they will meet us halfway. But they're not going to come in here and do all the work for us. Their single most important thing is, and I'll go back to that little saying, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry. We have got to start coming together as a race. We have, we have this got to stop being allowing ourselves to be manipulated. What can an average person do? I mean, how can we reach out to the Andromedans? Prayer, meditation. Um, you know, everybody has their own way of, of praying or, or whatever. You know, and, 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 and again, I, you know, I want to stress this. The Andromedans can help, but they're not God. They're not our saviors. We need to be our own saviors. We can ask them for guidance and help, but don't, they're, they're not God. Period. You know, it, it, don't start, don't worship them. Don't worship anybody. Worship the God inside of you. What will happen to those human beings who do not make the jump? They'll go somewhere else. And what will happen to those beings who do make the jump after the jump? They'll move into fourth and fifth density. And uh, those of us who survive this, this incredible ordeal that we're about to really experience will become... Um, new teachers um, and we'll be able to go to different worlds and teach what we know and be able to teach other evolving civilizations what not to do and how not to get themselves in trouble and um, I mean we have an incredible future if we can get through that it's gonna if 10% of the population of the planet can really get it together it'll create what is called the hundredth monkey syndrome and suddenly 11, 12, 13%, people will just start getting it. And it's going to take 10%. That's 500, 600 million people right now. Um, and, and, and it starts on an individual basis. Um, you know, it, the government's not going to tell you. You know, I mean, God, we could be in, they're going to play out the second coming. They're going to try to present a savior. They're going to present, present uh, project holographic images in space and say we're here to save you. They're going to do mock battle. I mean, they're going to screw with us big time. Sorry, I slipped out that word. You know, and 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 folks, we just got to start paying attention. Don't take anything at face value. Make them prove it. And, you know, whether you believe a word I'm saying, it doesn't matter. If somebody tells you that that this is truth, make them prove it. If it's real, it'll stand up to scrutiny. If it isn't, it won't. Because the truth can always stand on its own. It doesn't need help and it doesn't need lies to, stay, to stand up. And let's end it there. Thank you for this time. It's been a real honor for me.